Ladies and gentlemen, I have a dream. <laughs> a dream that we can end poverty. Something I'm sure that we all share. But to do that, we have to change the conversation about poverty. Today, I'm going to take us across the bridge that separates hype from reality. And the bridge is engineering. I'm going to retrace part of my journey seeking an answer to a simple question. What do engineers do? Now, I've been practicing and teaching engineering for 40 years, nearly. And I've spent the last 10 on research looking for answers to that simple question. You might think it a bit impertinent of me to be teaching engineering without a clear idea of what engineers do. But I'm only one of tens of thousands doing the same around the world and no one else pretty much thought to ask that simple question. So this quest started with the support of my family in Pakistan. My hair was going grey with frustration. I was employing local engineers to try out better ways to clear landmines in Afghanistan, working alongside Afghan D-miners. And here, by the way, is a real landmine, if you'd like to try one out. <laughs> Don't worry, it's been disarmed. <laughs> Soldiers, Taliban, farmers, children. All were having their legs blown off, and worse, and some still are today. Now, my engineers came with the best qualifications, some from the best British universities. And yet, they didn't seem to show the kind of practical skills that I could take for granted from engineers in Australia. At first, I thought it was something to do with me, being born in the country of their former colonizers. They were taking revenge. But then, eventually, I realized it wasn't me, after all. Engineers across India and Pakistan were performing much the same. In the words of one Pakistan politician, a miracle is an engineer who delivers anything useful. <laughs> now, 9-11 came, and the Afghan D-miners, based in Pakistan, all went home. And since then, they've been more concerned about not being kidnapped than finding better ways to do their jobs. At the inspiration of my dear late mother-in-law, we turned our attention to water supplies in nearby villages and schools. I have a picture of a school called Tandapani, cool water, ironically. There are water pipes in the ground, but no water was coming out. Until we installed a water pump and a well at the school, the kids had to carry buckets for an hour a day just to use the toilets. Nearby, in another village where they'd also asked for a water pump, my language skills gradually improving, a family insisted I join them for a cup of tea. As I entered their tiny family walled compound, they proudly showed me their water pump and told me that they had spent the equivalent of $1,500 installing it. I was astonished. Here were really poor people. How could they possibly afford that kind of money? Well, economists helped me understand that equation. Before they installed the water pump, the women had to carry buckets back from the village well, around about a one-hour round trip. The economists explained the concept, the shadow-priced value of time. It's how people value their unpaid labor and roughly relates to what a woman could earn. Currently in that village today, it's about 30 cents an hour. Now, when you figure out the time they spend carrying water and the extra hour required to boil it, the cost of the fuel, the cost of the water turns out to be $35 a tonne. And in case you're wondering what a tonne of water is, it's around about what it would take to fill two large bathtubs to the overflow. There are other ways to get water. In a city, you can order it in 20-litre plastic bottles. It's more reliable, it's cleaner, 
safer to drink and the cost $70 a tonne. Now the city water supply is intermittent. It's run by engineers, costs $20 a, a year and will deliver water to you for an hour or so every other day. Water that is almost certainly contaminated by sewage that seeps in through thousands of broken and half-repaired connections that cross open sewers. Now, of course, you can drink that water, but you take the equivalent economic penalty. Sickness for several weeks a year cuts into your earning potential. Now, it's important to realize that these costs for most people are not paid in cash. It's a loss of capacity. They pay in time and lost opportunities. Now, let's go back for a moment. Let's think about the minimum quantity you, water you need to survive. In a UN refugee camp, they'll give you 10 litres of water per day, which will be just enough for cooking and drinking and the other things you need clean water for. What does it cost, therefore, to provide this minimum quantity of water to 170 million people in Pakistan every day? Answer, using the estimates that I've given you, 10% of GDP. Yes, and that doesn't include food. Every day, up and down the country, women spend their entire days carrying water for their families and their animals. The cost counts. In Rolpindi, medical specialists tell me that 95% of the sickness cases they see every day could be prevented by washing hands and backsides. And for Muslims, that's a religious requirement. So why is it that most people avoid what is both a religious and a health requirement? Answer, they can't afford the water. It's too expensive. And we're not just talking about Pakistan, where people are poor because of this hideously high cost of water. We're not just talking about water either. Think about food. India and Pakistan grow three times as much food as they actually eat. The rest is lost because of inadequate engineering. Food is lost in storage, distribution, in processing, and in manufacture. With the electricity off for 18 or more hours a day in summer, a fridge is a mere decoration. You can't keep today's leftovers because they won't last till tomorrow with temperatures over 30 degrees all the time. And if you want to have a generator, it'll cost you 50 cents a kilowatt hour. And that's far more than most people can afford. So think about this, all the countries that we think as being low-cost countries, countries with low-cost labour, where our manufacturing industry might go to, they're actually hideously expensive to live in. And that's why most of the people are poor. So, why is it so much cheaper for us here today? Well, many people will tell you that us, that is the Western colonial powers of the 18th, 19th and early 20th century. We manipulated the world economy, impoverished our colonies and enriched our great-grandparents. We developed some impressive engineering and then we squandered most of the loot because we had a nasty habit of going to war with each other. We came to our senses. We started competing economically once the trade barriers enforced by empires came tumbling down. And the competition that ensued fostered an, an extraordinary improvements in engineering. Improvements which slashed the real costs of living for us, vastly reducing the amount of resources and human effort required for water, food, energy, and the comfortable lifestyle we've come to enjoy. So, what this does, what this engineering does, is liberate a huge amount of human capacity. Human capacity that can be used for governance 
improved security, education, health care, even volunteering, sport, recreation, the things that we enjoy in a civilized existence. But where does this leave the developing world? Well, they've got the message. They're educating hundreds of thousands, millions of engineers across India, China, Pakistan, and many other countries. But will these engineers be able to deliver what their people expect? With 10 years research on engineering practice, I'm having my doubts. Let's take the case of Indian engineers. The best Indian engineers don't work as engineers. They get jobs as programmers writing software. Why? Well, that's a question that troubles Indian manufacturers today. How can they compete, we are, they ask, when software companies pay our engineers three times what we can afford? Once again, economists provide a handy concept. It's called marginal product. It explains that what you get paid roughly equates to the value that you contribute to the organization that you work in. So, these young engineers who end up writing software contribute far more value doing something for which they have not been trained, compared with engineering for which they have supposedly been educated. Now, the engineering education, which is following the same curriculum as I have been teaching, consists almost entirely of mathematics and engineering science. It blinds them to the distribution of human know-how, finance, precedent and social influence. These are the realities that shape the contours of engineering feasibility in the real world. Now, in our research, we had a stroke of luck. We managed to find a tiny number of expert engineers in South Asia who have taught, them, taught themselves advanced and highly effective practice skills. They earn salaries higher than their counterparts in Australia and America because they contribute a great deal of value for the organizations that employ them. In fact, they make their organizations work. Thanks to our research, we can start to understand what these practical skills really are. Now, it's important to understand what the potential of this idea really is. The practice research which we've been doing here has opened up enormous opportunities. We're also inventing some interesting technology like localized air conditioning that can reduce the energy requirement for personal comfort by 80 or 90 percent. And in all of this, I have been inspired by a truly great engineer, Charles Yelverton O'Connor. He transformed Western Australia a century ago. His suicide has perhaps ensured that we remember his legacy more than many others with comparable achievements. He was described by those who knew him as a genius possessing extraordinary insight. When O'Connor arrived in Western Australia, water on the Kalgoorlie goldfields cost two shillings a gallon because it had to be carried hundreds of kilometers or distilled in vast condensers. Now at that time, to get 10 litres of water would take somewhere around two-thirds of a typical worker's pay. As I said on the slide, $70 for 10 litres you need to survive on. So O'Connor proposed a 530 kilometre pipeline from near Perth to the Coolgardie goldfields. It was to be larger and far longer than any other pipeline then in existence. He estimated it will cost two and a half million pounds and take five years to build. The achievement was extraordinary, partly because he was building this pipeline about as far as you could get from the industrialized centers of the world at that time. 
He prepared these estimates before he even had a map. Now, in order to bring the project in, he had to be extremely tough on the contractors. And the contractors didn't take it lying down. They complained bitterly to their friends and relatives. Remember that Perth at the time had a population of only 25,000 people. And this was the equivalent of taking on a multi-billion dollar project today. Imagine that in a town, a small town. Well, the contractors were related by blood or marriage to newspaper proprietors and members of parliament, who in turn made life so stressful for O'Connor that, as we know, ultimately, he took his own life. The pipeline was completed a year after his death, give or take. And it was operating at its design capacity with less than 8% overrun on the original budget. Now, consider that. How many projects today <laughs> particularly of that magnitude and advancing technology so far beyond the state of the art, how many projects come in anywhere near the original budget today? Well, the reason is, ladies and gentlemen, because we have lost so much of our practice skills. But thanks to our research, we can begin to rebuild those skills. In fact, that's what we have been doing. And now, let's go back. The high costs of water, food and energy across the developing world represent a humanitarian catastrophe. Nothing less. These costs are denying billions of people from enjoying a decent lifestyle. But this catastrophe is also an opportunity. Now, here in Western Australia, we have some amazing opportunities for engineers today with the right skills. And yet, not far away, there are opportunities hundreds of times greater again. A new generation of engineers equipped with up-to-date practice skills can not only liberate billions of people from destitution, but also they can build good businesses for themselves. So this new generation of engineers, ladies and gentlemen, this new generation of engineers equipped with practice know-how can awaken vast human potential as yet unrealized. That's my dream. <laughs>